Welcome back to the Grand Solar Minimum channel. Today is Monday, June 11th, 2018. Let's take a look at our solar conditions right now. We're looking at solar wind speeds at a very low 301.4 kilometers per second with a density of 15.8. Uh, last time I remember <clears throat> seeing the solar wind speed below 300 was last, I believe it was last August. And I think we had somewhere the reading right around 269. It was a record low uh, that they have monitored. So we'll keep our eyes on that. Things are getting real quiet. And looking at our sun, we have zero sunspots. Once again, that'll make six days in a row for us and 86 days with zero sunspots. And over here to my right, you guys can see about these sprites. Well, there's been a lot to talk about here recently. Um, and before I show us uh, coronal hole information or anything like that, I wanted to bring up this quick article. Uh, it says here, it was unreal. Martin Popek, a well-known photographer of the upward-directed bolts, told spaceweather.com, I recorded more than 250 sprites in only 4.5 hours of observation. That's nearly as many as I typical, typically see in the entire summer thunderstorm season. Uh, now, he captured many jellyfish sprites, several which, de which uh, decapitated. I recorded about 20 sets of tentacles only. Says, uh, you know, he, he's got a variety here. And some of these remind me of um, how they dictate what cosmic rays look like into the atmosphere. So I'll leave the link in the description. But I just thought this was kind of crazy to see over 250 sprites in a four and a half hour set and this guy here says that um you know he doesn't uh see that many in a season Let's see, and i know there's more pictures oh here's the image i wanted to show you guys but to me this is what they dictate dictate <coughs> what cosmic rays look like in our atmosphere so uh, maybe there's a connection there, I'm not sure, but that is definitely a result of a highly charged atmosphere. And taking a look at our star here for any kind of coronal hole action, right now we just see that one that's just below the equatorial region, not making a whole lot of noise. We might see a slight uptick in solar winds in the next couple of days. And in the very last frames here, we do kind of see a little bit of an active region here, but just judging the corona um, it doesn't look like anything too serious and if anything it could be it could possess stable magnetic field so uh, just something to maybe possibly watch right now we're not for certain and our TSI has peaked back up to a 1360.82 this almost matches the 1360.8184 that was registered on May 26 of 2018 this is the date for June 3rd of 2018 and let's get right into some articles now the first one I wanted to talk about was this um, very good point here of <clears throat> excuse me NASA with ice free prophecy uh, update now he wants to bring out how um, scientists have said within five to ten years the Arctic will be free of ice in the summer. And Republican Ed Markey, Democrat Mattis, uh, Republican, I'm sorry, Representative Ed Markey, Democrat from Massachusetts, uh, committee chairman, said that Dr. Hansen was right. Twenty years later, we recognize him as a climate prophet. And here's why. Uh, ten years ago, NASA's chief assignment. NASA's chief climate prophet, James Hansen, predicted the Arctic would be ice-free no later than this summer. <clears throat> now, the significance of this article um, has a little bit to do with the fact that we're supposed to be looking at zero ice right now in the Arctic. And there's some very uh, interesting ja uh, graphs here. But what really paints the picture for us all Here's what our sea ice thickness looks like right now. Now, if I had to say, notice this region right here has very thick ice and pay attention to this area right here as I get ready to show you what we had in 2008. Here's our thickness in 2008. 
So now we see the more intense thicker ice near the tip of the northern part of Greenland here. Okay, but notice this was weak. This was back from 2008. So I find it interesting that for scientists who were jumping up and down claiming that the Arctic, the Northern Arctic would be ice free. Here's 2018, or I'm sorry, here's 2008. Okay. See ice thickness. And here it is today. Now it's, it's, I would say it's more intense and thicker in the true Arctic North Circle. And 2008, not only was that a true statement as well, but we have more ice coverage down here between um, Russia, Alaska, United States, so on and so forth. And then you look here, uh, it's a little bit less through this area than once in 2008. But we are in uh, the summer. And interesting enough, 2008 was the beginning of the last minimum that we had, the the, site, the cyclic uh, minimum of 11 years. <clears throat> so to see the sea ice thickness, um, the comparisons really haven't changed. A little, like I said, a little thicker in some areas, but other than that, it hasn't changed. But yet all these climate people were telling us, and this guy breaks out the old articles, it says here the polar cap in the Arctic may well disappear this summer due to global warming. <laughs> the shrinking of Arctic ice caps has been astonishing. Okay, here we go. June 10th, 2008. June 10th, 2018. Do you see the problem with these claims? And I've heard them all year long. I've heard these people talk about how the Arctic is melting because we had a couple of uh, sudden warming incidents in the stratospheric part of our atmosphere pushed colder air down to the northeast and into western Europe yeah warmed up a little bit in the Arctic happens it does happen but you know when people say 45 degrees above normal that's not the entire region that was certain sections of the north not the entire part and 45 degrees above average you know, nobody specified whether it was Fahrenheit or Celsius, but either way, that could also still be below freezing. It could still be in the teens, for all we know. So, you know, it kind of gets my goat a little bit when you have all these scientists and mainstream media, their claim to fame is, well, so do the scientists around the world. They agree that the uh, shrinking Arctic ice cap has been astonishing, you know, and they, and they take this and they preach this and they brainwash people here we go june 20th 2008 arctic warming has become so dramatic that the north pole may melt this summer now this was back in 2008 it says here we're actually projecting this year that the north pole may be free of ice for the first time in history says david barber boy does he feel silly Another article from April 2008. North Pole could be ice-free in 2008. He said there is thin. Said there, <laughs> there is this thin first-year ice, even at the North Pole at the moment. This raises the spectrum, the possibility that you could that you could become ice-free at the North Pole this year. Is what he claims. Another one from BBC News. Swimmer aims to kayak to the North Pole. Well, I'll tell you, uh, I'm pretty sure that worked out well for him as these ice buster ships have been getting stuck in the North Arctic on their global warming missions. The best vessels that money can buy that's supposed to break through very thick ice is getting stuck time after time. They're traveling to the North to look at all that melting ice and they're getting met with all this thick sea ice. I mean, this goes on and on and on. And I'm glad, thanks to realclimatescience.com, I'm glad. It's good to see these things being brought to light. But when you look at the facts, and here you are in 2008, June 10th, okay? Now, they were predicting ice-free up here. 
even in the very thin areas, you know, in the circle here, you're still looking at moderate ice, not the thickest, coming out of a maximum, going into a minimum. Here we are, not even in our minimum yet, and we have increased thickness of sea ice in the true Arctic Circle right now. But mainstream media wants you to think that we're melting right now. The ice is melting, guys. So thanks again to RealClimateScience.com. I also used another article with them. Temperatures near the North Pole have been below freezing continuously since mid-September of last year, yet climate experts tell us the ice is melting at a record rate and will be gone later this summer. Here we go again. Apparently, they never completed preschool-level science, this writer has to say. Uh, again, we are looking at more graphs and more evidence that these people were being, um, you know, climate alarmist. There's no other way to put it, guys. We're, we're not even supposed to, we weren't supposed to have ice in the, in the Arctic in 2008. And once again, we're not supposed to have it right now, but yet, but yet here we are. I, I know I sound like a broken record, but here's right now, June 12th, June 10th, 2018. We're going to be ice free guys. According to what scientists are saying, global warming will cause the caps to be ice free this summer. Again, we're, we're hearing this again. I guess only one can wait and see. And I was kind of skimming through some uh, websites today. Robert Felix, a fan of his, and he writes about the Pope. And I saw something about this earlier in the week, too, actually over the weekend. And his take on this is Pope Francis has it exactly backwards on climate change. That's the headline for Gregory Wright Wrightstone, who wrote this article. This Pope has a long history of support in the notion of catastrophic man-made global warming. In 2015, he wrote his encyclical Lato Sai on climate change and the man's responsibilities to the planet as a warning to his flock of the dangers of our sins of emission through our use of fossil fuels and praise of renewable energy and living a more Spartan existence. Now, in truth, it will be the poor that will bear the brunt of the very policies the Pope endorses. Pope Francis' endorsement of the climate agreements like Paris Climate Accord will necessarily limit and reduce the availability of inexpensive, reliable energy that can help lift the billions of the poorest out of staggering poverty. Nearly a billion people do not have the benefit of electricity and another two billion have very limited access to the energy standard as we expect in the Western world. It's a shame the Pope wants to condemn his followers to grinding poverty based on what I see as a total fraud. And the link is here in the description. You guys can see that full link there. But, you know, I know there's people out there saying, how dare you? You're going after the Pope. You're, you know, this is blasphemy. And I'm not trying to make this about religion. But when you have a iconic leader like the Pope who does support the mainstream side. This is part of the reason why it's so hard to get through the average American. Uh, not only is the mainstream brainwashed people, but you know now we have the Pope telling everybody that um, you know man-made global warming is going to kill us. Uh oh, I have a I have something from Mario. Something funny must have just happened because we haven't seen Ian in the chat in some time, and he said. Maybe the Pope can get rid of Al Gore's demons. <laughs> Way to go, Ian. You busted up the show for that? <laughs> Just kidding. No, we, we have, we've missed our favorite Viking. He hasn't been around in a while. <clears throat> anyway, but uh, yeah, maybe he could. Maybe he could exercise Al Gore's demons. But, um, you know, I find it disheartening to see when we have to... Um, rely on mainstream media and then you got the pope who's back in these climate policies and this writer is on point because the energy that is affordable the renewable stuff that is affordable is your fossil fuels and whatnot and that is being limited so energy prices are sky high right now um 
And, you know, this Gregory Wrightstone is absolutely correct. The poor will bear the brunt of the very policies that the Pope endorses, like the Climate Accord in Paris. So I'll leave the link in the description. Good little write-up, or I, I wouldn't say write-up here. I would say an observation and something that was notable to put on the Internet for sure. And this is old news. This is from the 10th on Sunday, but I wanted to mention it. We were not on the air this weekend. And as far as volcano activity, I get my fair share from the Discord chat. And uh, But here we are, another one here. Uh, seismicity. Seismicity? What is that? Seismicity. Seismic. Seismicity. 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 Jeez. This is why geologists around the world roll their eyes at me, I guess, because I can't pronounce words like seismicity. At the Great Sitkin Volcano was at elevated levin, at levels over the past five days, according to the Alaskan uh, Volcano Observatory. At least you're humble and not a prick. Well, that's true. Um, the activity followed by uh, the signal at 1939 that represents short-lived steam explosion detected by seismic data. The AVO has thus raised the aviation color code to yellow and alert level to advisory. The last time the advisory raised a aviation color code to yellow and volcano alert to advisory was on November 22nd of 2017. Uh, the status was unchanged until January of 2018 this year. So just a little bit of activity to keep your eyes on. And here, another um, interesting fact here, the last known eruption episode took place back in 74, and it lasted from February 19th of 74 through September 16th of 74. It was a VI2. So just interesting, uh, lots of volcanoes. Um, 1974 has been, uh, it, you know, popping up in a lot of discussions when it comes to tornadoes, when it comes to seismic activity, when it comes to volcano activity, when it comes to talking about cold winters. We keep seeing the year 1974, and you have to go back through the historical data, data and say to yourself, is this really coincidental, or is this just like the pattern says it's going to show us? And this is not really an article, but I just kind of wanted to show off some of these pictures. These are all from the Kilauea Volcano kind of like a timeline history of all the photos that we've seen throughout the time that this has started erupting on May 3rd all the way to current present day uh, we've seen multiple ooh, there's a good that's a good picture of uh, something happened strange so yeah lots of great pictures here from all the way back from May 3rd right in the beginning and who would have thunk Looking at this picture right here, you, you still have neighborhoods and trees in place. And I'm sure as we get deeper into these pictures, and you know, this is all early stuff here. The cracks when they first started forming, the fissures started opening up. I mean, what a wild. It's hard to imagine that we've been watching this thing erupt for over a month now. You know, so, so over 600 homes have been destroyed. Ranchers lost farmland, residents, neighborhoods wiped out just amazing pictures I'm only halfway through what I wanted to get to was we we're looking at all these pictures of where the houses are and everything but here we start to get into some photos of the real damage and that is the charred landscape from the lava flows uh, and noticing how different the landscape is now so we'll keep watching this as Kilauea is not yet done and I don't care how long this is. The pictures still amaze me. Some of these people are really courageous. Ooh, I'm going to go back and look at that one. This is looks like, wow. Uh, you know, these photographers are brave. Some of these images are amazing, outstanding. I don't know if I could be that close up. We'll leave the link in the description. Y'all going to check these pictures out. CBS News did a pretty good job of putting together our a collection of photos from eruptions and fissures and craters and everything in between. And while we're on the subject of Kilauea, Kilauea volcano has been erupting since May 3rd, and according to the Hawaii County Civil Defense Agency, another small explosion occurred Sunday morning. The steam explosion spewed ash plumes over Kau 
the southernmost district of the Big Island. The eruption happened 38 days ago after Kilauea, uh, Kilauea's initial explosion, which sent lava, ash, and toxic gases throughout Hawaii's largest island. I'd like to, um, you know, maybe somebody in the chat could answer this one for me, but I've noticed um, over the days here, the, the, the more picks that we see from this region, um, we are looking at uh, more uh, more landscape that is brown. And I'm curious to know if all of that CO2 or lack of sunshine has contributed with this. We were talking about uh, freezing rain over the weekend. A 5.3 magnitude volcanic eruption occurred Monday morning about three miles west-southwest of Kilauea Volcano, according to the USGS. The Pacific Tsunami Warning Center reported no tsunami threat following the event. The earthquake was associated with ash explosion that happened around 4.43 a.m. local time. Uh, pretty much the same old, same old. Uh, this is actually continued from last week's update where I talked about Friday, how many homes are affected, 600 families. He's talking about ranchers and you know how hot everything is. The lava continues to flow, has reached a new high temperature of 2100. That's only half of the surface temperature of the, earth, of the sun, I believe. If I'm not mistaken, it's pretty hot. <laughs> Flooding to right now. Here's some good news. Uh, besides the part about the flash flood possibility, but we are about to see some relief to an area that has been um, hard hit with drought and um, fires and crop loss. But we have a non-tropical storm in the vicinity that will create substantial wind shear from Central America and the Western Caribbean to Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. So if we have wind shear, this storm is going to remain highly unorganized. So pretty much we have to witness a huge um, decrease in wind shear. And that's what this is talking about here. Wind shear variation of the speed with wind speed and direction at levels of the atmosphere. When wind shear is strong as it is now, it prevents circulation from developing just above the surface of the ocean. There's a small chance of development from the West Central Gulf later this week to near the Texas southwestern Louisiana coast this weekend. Now, this is a storm that um, some have been kind of warning about for the 15th through the 17th. Some actually say this is going to turn into a, a hurricane, but um, as we get closer to the day, I don't know if the models are going to support that or not. It could. Uh, remember, Harvey formed, uh, didn't take very much time, and the waters are heating up in that area. So, um, And people even touch base here. A repeat of the Harvey disaster is not expected with this situation, even though the disturbances is originating from the same general area as Harvey and may end up over Texas. Now, Harvey caused over $125 billion in damage. The feature in question is poorly organized while Harvey made landfall as a major hurricane in Texas. Slow forward movement of the disturbance is likely to continue while Harvey's rainfall stalled out for several days. While flooding problems cannot be ruled out in this early stage in Texas, they are unlikely to approach the scope of the disaster caused by Harvey. I'll show a little bit more about that in the GFS because I really think we see some good chances for um, we, we are looking for um, more chances of rain to kind of inundate this same region from bud and I'll talk about that too here just in a second nearly seven inches of rain heavy rain causes flood concerns into the afternoon this is for today Flooding and rain caused messy mo uh, Monday morning commute in Philadelphia, the region of the Shul Shulkill Expressway. Closed for hours as commutes to work took much longer than normal. Uh, let's see some of the rain totals that we got here. Here's a picture of the interstate getting flooded here. It says here up to nearly seven inches of rain fell in just a matter of several hours in parts of the area Monday morning. West Hampton and Burlington County had 6.6 .6 inches of rain, with neighborhoods getting at least an inch and a half overnight. Flash flooding took place in the areas with the heaviest rain. Uh, it says if you see a flooded road, roadway, turn around, don't try to drive through it, as you may not know how deep the water is. Those are words of wisdom. 
It says the heaviest of rain will be gone by uh, 7 a.m. this morning, but some localized flooding should continue, especially in poor drainage areas throughout the day. And this part of the country has seen a share of rain as of lately. The East Coast, the D.C. area, it's seen a share. And here's what I was talking about uh, for Bud. Now, we were talking about the storm on the 17th that might be impacting the Gulf. Well, from the opposite side of Mexico, Bud is possibly going to affect the same region with more rainfall. And it talks about how after gusty winds over the weekend fan the numerous blazes charring southwestern U.S., the southern U.S., that is, uh, tropical moisture from Hurricane Bud, currently churning in the East Pacific, may bo offer both sporadic rainfall and dry lightning by the upcoming weekend. Now, this fire has been going on out here in the Ute Park fire since May 30th. It's expanded to 36,000 acres as of Monday morning. This area is more than two and a half times the size of Manhattan. Significant improvement on the containment of wildfire made last Thursday and Friday with 77% containment being reached by Friday. Unfortunately, strong winds over the weekend prevented any further progress in containing the fire. And then we get into the rain here. So we will see rain. A southerly flow of air will provide a pathway of tropical moisture from bud to get pulled into the southwest late this week into the weekend. So we have the other side of Texas over here, also looking at a tropical uh, disturbance. And of course, uh, they're saying Hurricane uh, Bud right now. Last I checked, it was actually a cat too. So we'll follow that path too once we get into the GFS. But this area right here, guys, in the green, uh, they need it the most. Um, uh, further east as well in New Mexico and western Texas, but they'll get their share of rain from this system coming up from the Gulf over the weekend, not just from the system that's on the other side of Mexico, near the Baja area, I should say. And another article about Hurricane Bud affecting southwestern Mexico. Here's what I wanted to show you. Here's its development right now as of uh, earlier today, June 11th. Here's its path. This is where we might see it by Saturday. So um, according to NOAA, by the time it does have its effects on any areas in the southwest, I believe it's going to come at later in the week and not this weekend. They might have misspoke a little bit by that. But the system is expected to produce total rain accumulations of 3 to 6 inches much of uh, southwestern Mexico. There will be isolated amounts of 10 inches into Tuesday afternoon. These rains could cause life-threatening flash floods and mudslides, warns the National Weather Service. So a couple, unless I just read this wrong here. Ah, late this week into the weekend. Yeah, I don't see how uh, the pool starts, I guess. Uh, the moisture doesn't start until later in the week. And a little bit of the cold stuff. Snow fell on parts of the U.S. Uh, northwest just days before the first day of summer. This is crazy. I know this happens up there. I, I, I get that. But here we got two inches of snow on the ground in Dixie, Idaho. Okay, these folks are ready for... Look at this. This looks like January. And then what a gorgeous view from the mountaintop. But that's literally how drastic the change is. You wake up in a nice morning, but you look up and see snow falling on the mountains. That's absolutely breathtaking. June in Montana. And, of course, more snow showers. I do believe this one, if we can get it to play, I think there's a pretty... Yeah, there's the time-lapse rainbow there. It's pretty neat. And that's from snow. I guess that's a snowbow. Right here is a map of the average snow water equivalent found normal despite the active melting. Uh, and here's our chart showing us where we see all the melt right now, current snow. And here it is for Idaho as well. But just to see these pictures, I'm sure people, after the winter we had this year, and this was a time lapse. Uh, Mari shared this on uh, our Facebook page as well. And this was earlier this morning, and I'll zoom in. This is three hours of uh, time lapse here. I don't know if they go through the whole thing, but... Um, 
from what I saw, it was snowing well into the morning to mid morning at that point of the video earlier. So just crazy. We're seeing snowfall here in June, um, cooler temperatures, taking a look at our, uh, SST anomaly in the North Atlantic. And it did rise to just about the uh, mid four on the 0.497 now. So it's dropped once again, closer to 0 0.5, negative five, I should say. So we'll continue to watch this as the weather continues to be cooler in parts of the world, especially in the Northeast and Western, or I'm sorry, Northwest as well. With all the volcano eruptions, you have to wonder when does all this start meeting up and really start affecting our climate? And will it take until next year before we start to see the real effects of a, of a solar minimum? I, I just can't believe we're talking about uh, 2019, 2020 being the official start of this grand solar minimum as far as this current cycle coming up. So uh, we're already seeing grand solar minimum type numbers in the early goings. Let's take a look at our local radar or national radar, I should say. And we're dealing with more rain in the Ohio Valley as they have seen their share of rain as well. They're flooding. We were talking about uh uh, Philadelphia having flooding rains that now has moved out of the area. We've got some storms in far northern Minnesota and pretty quiet for the rest of the country as far as the central plains and the west coast has in store. Some light showers in the Montana area and of course uh, Florida who is not known for the sunshine state lately. You're dealing with some showers on the panhandle and the far southern tip. So nothing really severe. Uh, to come to play now I want to play through this windy forecast because it's monitoring two things right now uh, first it's showing how organized bud is right now and bud looks to slam into the Baja some point by the weekend now at the same time that we're talking about hurricane bud and you guys can clearly see well, actually you can't so let me go ahead and zoom in for you over here talking about it like you can see it but pretty organized as we get to Thursday and then let's zoom back out and watch the trajectory of this storm coming up now it's definitely going to hit landfall sometime at the end of the week where we start to see moisture develop now this is the European models so bud starts pumping moisture up through the southwest by the end of the week and there is that disturbance that they're talking about near Houston from a possible development from a storm in the Gulf Coast and as we get to the 18th it's a possibility that we see the moisture from these two storms merge right over Texas so you get a shot of rain in the the extreme parts of New Mexico, Arizona that need the rain the most, and then western Texas, eastern New Mexico, into Oklahoma, Kansas, you start to get more rain from this possibility of a development of a storm in the Gulf as well for this weekend. My mistakes, by the way. It's only Monday, guys. So Bud is has a chance to impact the United States by Saturday of this weekend. Now here I picked up where Wendy left off at the 15th and I go a little bit farther I'm sorry into the 20th into the 21st and we can see that the system that the GFS is picking up is a little more organized than it looks on the Euro and however Bud is long gone by this point so Bud makes landfall according to GFS around the 15th which is Friday in the Baja region, southwestern Mexico, uh, doesn't pack a lot of moisture. But the good news is, is that it does give New Mexico, parts of Arizona, Colorado, especially the southern part of Colorado near the central part where they desperately need the rain. They're going to get heavier rainfalls from. So now the GFS is starting to line up a little bit more with the European model. No real organization, as you see on Sunday, that stormy region here to the Gulf. Uh, that does not look like a hurricane, nor does it look like it could form into a hurricane, according to the GFS. So the GFS is making this look a lot weaker 
than it was last week. Uh, we saw a little bit more development, and you could clearly see the cyclonic action. But as this thing makes landfall, and here we are Tuesday, and we were told that this was not going to be a Harvey-like situation, but this system brings rain to the region all the way through Wednesday of next week. As you see scattered rain chances throughout the entire state of Texas, once again, eastern Mexico, uh, central Colorado, and southern parts of Colorado will get more rain. So, yeah, it's not much of a punch when you're talking about hurricane or anything like that, but to see the moisture that kind of hangs around in that region, and again, this is really far out. This is the 27th of June, but there's a pattern developing here. And I'd like to think that, um, again, even though we are slated to look at showers in that region starting as early as the, oh, 17th of June, you see a line of storms into Mexico, into New Mexico, and then from the 17th all the way through Wednesday, Thursday, even Friday, that region will have chance for rain from that moisture from the combination of bud and this tropical disturbance that we have in the Gulf that right now no one's too confident about naming it anything just quite yet. Uh, but like I said, the organization of this storm, to me, it seems like it's fallen apart compared to what we've seen it on Friday. And you can see it in the very far bottom of your screen where bud is and that disturbance into the Gulf starts making itself known probably right around I'd say around June 16th and it's very disorganized just a lots of moisture not real rotation really until it gets close to land so the lowest millibar pressure it's forecasted for right now is right here on Sunday June 17th when we're still at a thousand two millibars so just something to keep our eyes on the two systems could combine they could bring more moisture but let's just put it this way that that area of the country needs all the rain it could get right now. And I'm not sure that there's enough that's going to put a dent into that drought situation down there, but it's a start. And with that being said, Mari, how was the chat today? Other than our favorite Viking uh, coming back and saying hello. Oh, yeah. All the greats, Sarman, Henrik, there's, there's all kinds of people here. Come on at the door. Is it? Okay, sorry, you, they couldn't hear you anyway, so go ahead and repeat. Oh. Well, the mic wasn't even in your face. Wow. So you got to talk. What do I have to say now, Jake? Well, I, I was asking I about oh, the chat. Well, I was saying all the greats are in the chat, and I'm shocked because it's like afternoon, and, you know, I wasn't, it was a not scheduled uh, program, and we got all the greats. I'm not going to list you all. Just look at the chat. It's amazing. We have a bunch of people, um, apparently the reason why there are no unicorns now is because of climate change uh that is what i found out in the chat yeah uh, right well also on on job uh injuries workman's comp is also now blaming climate change on all the workman comp um oh it's crazy if you go to what's up with that that's a story i almost put in today's show but if you go to what's up with that they talk about how women are not as good in the cold as men are not as good in the heat because men are working harder than the women in the heat <gasps> oh yeah so oh boy so yeah i didn't want to put that up because i really don't want to get you guys all riled up but uh, cats out of the bag go to what's up with that uh, dot com and you'll see the story where it's a claim where global warming <laughs> is to blame for more workman comp and uh, on job related injuries so Anyway, all right, guys, thanks for tuning in. We're glad we were able to be a part of your Monday afternoon. Uh, we will be back tomorrow, probably around the same time as the evenings. The next two nights are going to be tied up. But we will see you guys tomorrow afternoon. Again, thanks for tuning in, and we'll talk soon. <laughs>